You're listening to the Groundbreaking Podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. The Global Ag Tech Initiative is the catalyst for connecting, engaging, and fostering dialogue in global food production, with technology as the foundation for driving innovation and solutions. The Groundbreaking Podcast brings forth voices across the industry to discuss trends, best practices, and innovative ideas driving agriculture forward in a rapidly changing world. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Groundbreaking Podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. We are recording from the Women in Ag Tech meeting in Glendale, Arizona, and co-located with the Vision Conference. And I'm here with Kathleen Glass, VP of Marketing with AquaSpy. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Heather. And I'm Heather Tunstall. I'm the co-chair for the Global Ag Tech Initiative. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about marketing, clearly something that you know quite a bit about, and how the ag industry can not only learn a little bit more, but talk about how we talk to and about each other within the industry. What got me passionate about being part of Women in Ag Tech Alliance, being part of the Global Ag Tech Alliance, is that you know I hear and see a lot of challenges in ag tech adoption that really what it comes back around to is challenges in selling and marketing the solutions that are new. And I've been in early stage sales and marketing for all of my career and, you know, came out of the Silicon Valley originally. I'm in San Diego, which is a a tech hub and have been focused primarily on the early adopter. And what's happening is that even though the ag industry is hundreds of years old, technology, aside from, you know, the Henry Ford tractors and John Deere, I mean, that was 100 years ago, but specialty crops, tech is relatively new. And so often what happens is that startups come in and they get dazzled by their great idea and they start talking about all their features. And we're really in the middle of that right now with ag tech and ag adoption. And so growers are getting frustrated. The ag tech startups and early stage companies are getting frustrated. So I think there's a lot that we can bring from other industries to this. Now, one of the things that I learned as a marketer, which was really challenging for me early on, was that, you know, you come out of high tech, pilot is 90 days. In ag, a pilot is three to five years. Yeah, a little different. And yeah, and I don't I don't think that the that you know the ag tech startups really understand that yet. Mm. And it's not you, you have to you have to really put the benefits forward for the grower. You have to talk about ROI. You have to really present a business case. And not unlike a lot of other industries, maybe growers are a little bit more about show me. I have mm. to touch it myself. I have to see my neighbors using it. I have to see others using it. But that gives us some opportunity as marketers to look for collaborations to help Mm -hmm. us accelerate that a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. And talking about some of your past experience outside of agriculture, what are some things you learned in marketing that you're able to adapt to some of the challenges we're facing in ag right now, perception-wise, go-to-market-wise? What kinds of lessons did you learn in your past experience that you've brought forth now? You know, there's there's a lot to be brought forward. Interestingly enough, I started to make this shift around 2005, where pretty much early in my telecom and AI and IoT career, I'd been selling to IT folks. And they have their own particular way of, you know, behaving like early adopters and signaling and testing and adopting. I mean, early adopter as a tech person just wants to try it. They don't care if anybody else is using it. They don't care if it's proven. They just are like, yeah, I'll try it out. Except for about 2005, I got into driver safety and was selling into what we would call, again, more tech-sensitive or tech-late adopter industry. So we were selling into concrete. Mm. We were selling into trash, waste management. We were selling into taxis and limos and folks that weren't typically high-tech industries. And this is 2005. So there, there were even laws that were kind of against us. So there were privacy issues and you know, spying and recording issues. And so, I, you know, that was where also we learned that you want to work with lobbyists, you want to work with researchers, you want to work with the insurance industry. So go and find other folks to collaborate with to help with that adoption and 
collect the data, prove the points. And so, you know, really try to bring that part of it, that part of my experience, marketing into those sort of late adopter. I did some oil and gas at one point, which was really late adopter. I mean, they use paper and pencil because things will explode if you write a computer on an oil rig. So, so, you know, I have worked through these transitional types of things. So I I have hope. I know it will happen, but it's going to take longer. And we have certain things as marketers that we need to do. And we partner with universities. I've spent a lot of time being part of groups like we were talking about. You know, it's not, and this is, I think, a different thing from Silicon Valley, where in Silicon Valley, it's very competitive. And it's like me against my competition. And here it's more like coopetition. You know, all of us need to come together. There isn't enough adoption for us to be competing at this point. And there's lots of open opportunity. So we can do collaboration and coopetition working with our competitors in similar types of technologies in, in the industry. You know, the drone, a drone is like an IoT sensor, right? And you've got above ground sensors and below ground sensors. And so you really want to think about How can we also partner with the rest of the ecosystem to come up with a holistic solution for the growers? Because one of the things we hear a lot is, I don't want to hear your point solution. This isn't, you know, if we're working the channel, it's not like a multiple choice menu. I'll take one from column A and one from column B. Please present me a total solution. So that comes back to that collaboration. It's like, let's partner for that. And I love that. And I think that's a, it's a common theme that we're hearing a lot more of right now is that collaboration aspect because people are looking, like you said, I want to know if I implement something, it's just going to go and do what I need it to do. And that takes pieces from different technologies, different companies, all of that. And I'm curious, you know, when we're talking specifically about marketing, a lot of the companies may not have a marketer on staff, right? What would be the key things they need to do to make sure that they're getting their message out there? Well, there's there's a couple. There's great resources mm-hmm. that one can go to, and there's not they're not just in Silicon Valley anymore. There are tech accelerators, and I'm so excited to see more tech accelerators focused on ag and ag tech. Kind of, uh, there's a hub around Land O'Lakes. They're very supportive, and so there's like an accelerator hub around where they are, and so you see that we've got some hubs around some of the University of California areas where they're sort of doing. Uh, hub. So we talked. I talked to somebody today, and we were suggesting she got involved with Je- with Vine, and the Vine is a, a University of California initiative that's helping bridge these communications. And so the good thing is, is that you don't have to buy. You don't have to hire somebody full time on staff. You can get somebody fractional. You can work with a good agency. I mean, I've talked to a number of different folks here at Women in Ag Tech where they have PR agencies, communication agencies, web agencies. So you can work with somebody who has that domain expertise and you don't have to have them on full time. You can go through one of these accelerators. You can get involved in your local extension courses, your Mm -hmm. community extensions and like, you know, University University of Florida, uh, UNL TAPS, a whole bunch of different resources that you can take advantage of that, is beyond just having to hire somebody in-house. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, thinking through sort of every industry has its evolution, right? And obviously, ag is going through a huge one right now. Marketing also has gone through quite an evolution. It used to be very transactional, very, you know, sign on the dotted line and you get your ad and there we are. Let's talk a little bit about some of the newer ways that people are marketing and what makes sense now in terms of storytelling, in terms of making sure that you're getting across a full picture with context. Yeah, wow. And and it's interesting. I've actually even sort of gone back a little bit more old school because I had tended to be quite digital, right? You know, the CIOs and, the, and those folks are, you know, you can find them on Zoom Info and you can download the data and, and then market to them using your Salesforce uh, CRM or your HubSpot CRM. And so, you know, have this whole digital marketing, but interestingly enough, have had to really rethink and broaden or even bring back some of my marketing to be more hyper regional and think more local about that. So that might mean we've been doing really well with crop based regional Facebook ads. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't, wouldn't do Facebook for it. <laughs> Any other group I've been with, that was new for me. But I went and found some experts. So that wasn't me. I knew that I didn't know anything about Facebook marketing. So I hired an agency that does this out of 
planta and they're phenomenal. And so it's test and evolve. And so we try one message and then we really honed our zip codes. But that was a big thing in ag is it's crop and zip code specific. And even I, I heard this at the sustainability conference, it's even East Kansas versus West Kansas. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Like really specific. So that was much more hyper-regional. So you can think about regional, uh, hyper-local uh, SEO, search engine optimization. Now, some of that's changing with the cookies and things like that. But then if you've got a closed media entity or platform like Facebook or Meister Media, you have your digital platforms. And so one of the things I'm using from a digital perspective is basically the retargeting through the Meister properties. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll, I'll advertise in the row crop or, you know, crop life or the, you know, the vegetables or whatever, and then have that digital follow on. We do a lot of print ad. Growers still like their print. They do. Um, I'm an experiment. I think I want to experiment with podcasting. That's been a big thing. I haven't done that much of it, but growers, especially in uh, row crops, spend a ton of time in their cab and they're real digitally connected. They've got a lot of different things connected to the internet. And so podcasts are a really great thing because it's so hyper local. I did field signs. I'm oh, literally field signs yeah. because you drive past the same corner and you want that brand reinforcement. So I got really creative. <laughs> sure. This was like, you know, I haven't done bus stops yet, but I might have to. You know, and really thinking about like, how do we do this differently? Yeah. And reach that. And, and I'm glad to see more digital adoption. So we're, we're doing a fair mix of email marketing, digital targeting, as well as the print and the Facebook. Yeah, I love that. And I think what you just hit on is so important for people who aren't in marketing to understand is just how specific you have to get with identifying who your audience is and what your audience likes to how they like to consume their information, yeah. right? Because it's different and it's different based on message too. So if you're just going for awareness, mm -hmm. that may be a visual sign. If you're going to build a relationship, it might be a story. It might be a podcast. Yes. yes. Um, and we've done videos. Yeah. We do videos early on. Podcasts are good. We do a pretty regular blog. We do sponsored content. Same thing. Yeah. I had to push it out or bring them to the website early on because I knew that this was very crop specific. We started an ag facts pages. So it's watermelon and corn. And we got a specific page, which we are going to use as the landing pages for our Facebook pages. But the fun thing was at SEO, right? Search engine optimization, keyword. And we were doing the coal crops and my business partner comes running in and I, I didn't even quite understand what he was showing me, but our coal crops page was on the top of the search engine. The organic results. Beautiful. We, we were beating everybody else. If you want to read about cold crops, we were there. Number one. That's the gold standard. <laughs> Get to the top of the search yeah. for and, and, you know, so it's like be creative about what you're doing. Make sure that your, your message is clear and concise and has ROI in it. So I do some experimentation. I mean, there's, you know, you, you still need to do your A-B testing. I mean, we yep. just did an email campaign and I got phenomenal open rates. But, you know, if 20% of the people open them, 80% didn't. So, okay, we got to try another subject line. Right. And just keep using the same one. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, that speaks very much to what you mentioned earlier about iteration and ad adaptation. Once you realize something's not working, you move to some new yeah, way I, of doing it, right? I think we test our Facebook ads, you know, every every 90 days or so. Yeah, that's great. So for non-marketers, let's dig a little bit deeper into what's retargeting and why is it beneficial? So retargeting is, it used to be a lot more stocky and a lot of those cookies and the, those things have trans, you know, sort of been mitigated. Google doesn't allow tracking you across different sites. Like if you'd been shoe shopping on Amazon and then you st kept seeing the same shoes when you went to the weather channel. I mean, that, that stuff fortunately is kind of transitioning down, but if it's literally something that you're interested in soil moisture monitoring for cotton crop or for coal crop, then that's legitimate interest. Mm -hmm. And so if you're then on, and I came in through the produce page, then other things that are related to that topic, maybe there's a seed page about the, you know, whatever you're planting your broccolis or, or whatever the timing is on that. So then my ad will then 
retargeting to go into that page as well. So I hope I just explained that very well. I, you know, it, <laughs> what it's hilarious as you're explaining that the only thing I think of is how many videos of golden retrievers I see on Instagram now. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. we have soft to the golden retriever. But that's exactly right. When you show interest in something online, mm -hmm. the internet pays attention yes. and starts to go back to you and say, hey, remember, you're interested in this. And yeah. you keep getting fed that information. So retargeting is very similar to that. And, you know, I think it's a great way to remind people. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the buyer's journey, right? It's not always just, I'm going to get online. I know exactly what I want and I'm going to click on it. Don't we wish that were the case? You have to fall, but also pay attention to where, where your customer is. That's so important. And there was a conversation earlier today about, I, I heard someone mention, are you on TikTok for your market? TikTok. Everybody talks about it. Sometimes it works for people. So one thing that I thought was interesting and to think about this in a different way and all the different facets of marketing, social media marketing can be anything from posting something on YouTube to yes. LinkedIn blog to Facebook ad yeah. to a TikTok video. However, does it make sense for your audience? Because yeah, part of what we think through, and when you talk to most people, Instagram and TikTok are kind of their unplugging mm -hmm. decompression sites. They go on there to look at golden retrievers, yes. family videos, mm -hmm. things like that. It's what they do when they're done with work, yeah, right? Exactly. So B2B, it's a big challenge. Not impossible, but it's a big challenge to break through that. And uh, you may be flirting with annoying people more so than engaging people. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, selecting the channels according I, to Yeah, audience. and I was I was really bummed that X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, has devolved so much because ag Twitter was awesome. And as I got involved in that early on and I was I was listening and learning and I, you know, made some connections and asked somebody and the gal said, Well, the reason this is so important is we're miles from our neighbors mm. and our community, and this is how we're communicating. Yeah. So social became a really, you know, social as in Twitter at the time, became an important connection point mm -hmm. and sharing point and, you know, what was going on in the community. And 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 literally the ha hashtag Ag Twitter was really, very really powerful. Now that whole platform has devolved, and so I'm largely shutting that down, but it makes me sad because so then we they, we said, well, is Facebook viable as well? And I'm going to continue the program, but we have to be very careful with it because growers are, we were talking about B2C versus B2B. A grower is a consumer who also happens to have a business so we had to be really careful to parse out gardeners <laughs> from right. um, somebody who's got a commercial vineyard or, you know, a commercial blueberry growing operation. And that's still, you know, so we were like very careful about our messaging and the pictures that we used and everything in our ads. And I still get, why are you on here bugging me? <laughs> well, then just ignore it. It's not right. you. Okay. Keep rolling. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> but, um. So Facebook was an unexpected success. LinkedIn is not because, I mean, unless you're a big grower, I mean, like McCain's or Driscoll's or whatever, you know, that's, you know, a much bigger entity. You're going to find people on LinkedIn, but you can find partners on LinkedIn. So yes. if you're a startup or you're looking for collaborators or people in other countries to collaborate with, particularly internationally, I would go to LinkedIn, but I'm probably not ever going to run ads on LinkedIn. We do have a YouTube channel. We do two things with that. We very much use it as an educational platform. So it's part of our customer support and our dealing dealer onboarding. Okay. So all of our educational content is recorded in YouTube. And so that's part of that educational training platform, customer yeah. support. And YouTube is a huge search engine. Yeah. And we talk so much about people who are self-learners and guess where they go. Yes. <laughs> they go to YouTube. Yes. <laughs> that's how many people. So I need to fix, figure out how to fix this faucet or what <laughs> exactly exactly no i won't call it qualified professional i'm going to do it myself but they go to youtube so you know it's a very powerful tool and it gets to that point of storytelling it's that longer form storytelling even short videos can be considered longer form storytelling because it gives you the visual gives you the audio gives you explanation and context and i think that you know marketing has evolved more into that storytelling realm through a variety of different touch points you've got 
the quick hit visuals. You've yes. got the storytelling. You've got collaboration and all of that. So I think that's very powerful. Content, content, content. Yeah, we hear it all the time. We hear content all the time. So, you know, I think one thing that we want to touch on a little bit um, with the Global Ag Tech Initiative's mission to increase adoption of ag technology, how can marketing play a role in that? Marketing definitely needs to play a role in that because we as communicators, we as the communicating community have to do that better. We need to own our content. We need to make sure we're reaching all those channels. We need to make sure we're making our messaging hyper-regional, hyper-crop focused. Aquaspite is across both uh, row crops as well as uh, specialty crop. And I remember talking to Joe because the conversations with the row crop community are very different than they are with the specialty crop community. Yeah. And there's not a ton of us as ag tech companies that go across both, but there's there's sufficient. Sure. And you really have to be very cognizant in your messaging that you're differentiating that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, marketers can help educate. We can coach. We can be mentors. We can look for our peers. Mm -hmm. We can support each other. That's great. And I think we've, we've touched on a lot of really great tips and, and tricks. Anything else you want to add in terms of if somebody's struggling with their marketing messaging? And I love how you keep talking about honing your message because I think that is the cornerstone of yeah. marketing. It's making sure your message is right. But any other tips and tricks you can give to those who are dipping their toe in marketing or not sure where to start? There's a lot of great resources. Uh, I mentioned HubSpot. And HubSpot has so much free content around best practices in marketing. In fact, we were talking about AI today. HubSpot will even help you. They have AI that will help you write a sales email. Yeah. You have all these resources. You have, you know, places that have ton of free advice. There's webinars. There's different events that you can go to. And I think the thing that to remember is, yes, the adoption cycle is different with the growers. It's much longer. But they're buyers like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And this is still an early adopter sale. So read Crossing the Chasm. Everybody should read Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. There we go. Because it talks about knocking down the bowling pins. And so, you know, don't don't start with every crop. Maybe start with blueberries or maybe start with potatoes and really get what that grower community is doing. Get that region, get your partners, and then branch out from there. CEOs need to be sales and marketers. I mean, you can't just push this off to some magical person that you call a marketer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to learn and listen and bring that back in. So Yeah, that's a great point. At least understand what it takes at, at a surface level. And then, you know, when you don't have a marketer on staff, reach out, collaborate, find an agency. Yeah. You know, so I think that's wonderful. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today on our groundbreaking podcast. For those of you who would like to subscribe, uh, please do so. Groundbreaking podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. And again, here with Kathleen Glass, VP of Marketing at AquaSpy at the Vision Conference in Glendale, Arizona. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Groundbreaking Podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. You can subscribe to our podcast at globalagtechinitiative.com by clicking on the podcast tab in the menu or by subscribing to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the Global Ag Tech Initiative's weekly e-newsletter, The Signal, for all things ag tech. Visit globalagtechinitiative.com and click on the Signal Subscribe button on the right-hand side of the home page. Of course, you can also find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Global Ag Tech Initiative. To get even more in tune with the global ag tech space and be active in its advancement, consider joining the Global Ag Tech Alliance. More information on how to join the Alliance is available on globalagtechinitiative.com. The Global Ag Tech Initiative and the Groundbreaking Podcasts are produced by Meister Media Worldwide. I'm Heather Tunstall, co-chair for the Global Ag Tech Initiative. Thank you for joining us today.